What a great and powerful song. Thank you for that, Joe. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and dismiss the boys and girls to Kids Church at this time. And you know where to turn your Bible. It's there in your notes. 1 Peter chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. I was thinking about having a picture up on the screen of a certain character um, that I grew up uh, watching in commercials from time to time. And and let me see if I I can say the catchphrase. I want to see if you can guess who the character is, all right? You guys ready for this? They're great. Tony Tiger. Tony the Tiger had that catchphrase, right? They're great. And uh, I really ran out of illustrations, so remember we've been talking about good to great, so I used that one. So to get your minds focused back on what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about being, becoming good to great in God's eyes, right? We, we all want to be great, and specifically as Christians, we should desire to be great in the eyes of God. 1 Peter chapter 5 speaks of that. And I want to really quickly just go over the first uh, five, five and a half verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want to let you know kind of what's going on, set the context. So 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, this is what Peter says. And he's speaking to Gentiles, mainly Gentile Christians who've been scattered abroad. They're all over the place. They're in different places. And this is what he says in verse number 1 of chapter 5 of 1 Peter. Therefore... I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come before you. We, we plead with you, Lord, that you would, you would show up today in, in might and power. Lord, we already feel your presence here through worship. I pray that you would ready hearts. And Lord, most importantly, I pray that you would be ultimately glorified through the preaching of this message. God, I pray that you would just continue to speak to us, help us to give you honor and praise in all we do. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So verses 1 through 5, we see what's going on. It's basically Peter speaking to elders, and elder is another term for pastor. So verses 1 through 5, he's speaking to pastors, and, and I want to give you a quick rundown of what he says, okay? This is not the meat of the message, but it's important because it sets the tone for the message. And he says this, the first thing he says in verse 1, he, he gives an exhortation or a challenge. He, he, he gives an encouragement to pastors everywhere. And then he says in verse 2, shepherd the flock of God. That is, you know, keep over them, watch over them, guard them like a shepherd would his flock. Then he says exercise oversight, that's take responsibility. And then he gives the reasons why. He says, not because you have to, right? It's not out of compulsion. But instead, do it because you get to and you want to. It's voluntary and because it's God's will. He continues and says, not for sordid gain. That's to say, not for money, right? Not for a paycheck. But do it with eagerness and excitement. You get to serve and do it with this excitement you have. Then verse 3, he says, not lording it over those under you. That's, don't take abuse of, of the power given to you. Don't just say, hey... I get to do whatever I want, I can say whatever I want, and these people are, are here for my purposes. He says, no, don't, don't do that. He says, but lead by example, by what? By serving the flock of God. And then verse 4, he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, that is when Jesus returns, something pretty neat happens. He says, you, speaking to pastors, will receive the unfading crown of glory. That's something that we as pastors, Joe and Mike and myself, that's, and we, we, can, we, can, we can strive for, and, and we're not promised it, but if we do the will of God and we, we do this in verses 1 through 5, God promises the unfading crown of glory to pastors. What an exciting thought for me. And then in verse 5, he says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And he's talking about respect and submission. Now, we know that not every older person uh, is the wisest or most spiritually mature, so he's not saying no matter what, give authority to them or 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 subject to them but have an attitude of submission towards those that are older so that's what we have in verses one through five okay so the stage is set and he's basically saying listen pastors you're to be servants 
You're to be humble. You're to lead the flock, care for the flock. Your motives should be pure. And then he transfers from speaking to pastors, and then he says a a phrase uh, in verse 5 that I want us to pick up on. Look at verse 5. He says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And then he says this phrase, and all of you. So now he's speaking to every Christian. He's speaking to the Christians then, the Gentile believers then, and he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. So we understand that he's speaking to us from here on out. Make sure you understand that. And Peter now gives three specific instructions in verses 5 through 7 that will allow you and will allow me to go from good to great in God's eyes. So he says, all of you, young and old, men and women, boys and girls, people of all ages, races and nations, right? It's like the circus. (laughs) He's saying, listen, all of you believers, this is what I have for you. Verse 5, the second part, he says, clothe yourselves with humility. That's the first thing he says. Clothe yourselves with humility. Now, what is humility? What is humility? Humility is what? It's not thinking poorly of yourself, right? It's not thinking, oh, oh, poor me. We've talked about this before, and we've talked about it recently. It's not thinking less of yourself. You're not a doormat. But what humility is, is it's simply not thinking of yourself at all. You begin to think of other people first. Their needs come first, their desires, their passions, their heart. You start to think of others, and so that's what true humility looks like. Humility is submission. He talked about this earlier with the young men and the pastors and the elders. We are to submit. Submission is a fundamental attitude of spiritual maturity. Did you hear that? Make sure you get that. That's an important, important point. Submission is a fundamental attitude of spiritual maturity. You want to see the people that are the most mature in the Christian life? Look at the people that are submitted to authority, people that are submitted even to people who aren't in authority over them, people who are looking to serve, people with humility. Those are the people that are truly spiritually mature. And it made me think of some guys that came to mind, some people here. thought of a lot of people here, but specifically I thought about our church staff. I thought about Joe Davis, I thought about Jane, I thought about Mike, I thought about Diane, I even thought about my wife. I thought about our teachers that teach in our Sunday school classes. They exercise humility, and it's an amazing thing to see. It's amazing for them to, to all of which are older than me, submit to me. Now, now that's, that's strange, right? I mean, from a human perspective, that se- might seem a little bit odd, but, but God has placed me in this position, and so he's given me the responsibility not the privilege, the responsibility to shepherd the flock. And he's put people on our staff and under my leadership so that I can serve them first. You see, all of one through five is an example. He says, listen, be a servant first. You're the leader, you're the elder, you're the under shepherd. You serve first and set the example. So that's my responsibility. And then that's our staff's responsibility. But then he says that phrase, all of you, all of you have this attitude. It starts with the leadership, right? Right? So it starts with the leadership, and then he says, clothe yourself with humility. Now I'm going to ask uh, Joe, now I just built him up, I'm going to kind of embarrass you. Would you grab what's on the front seat here, this this orange thing looking, and would you go ahead and put that on? Because what clothe, what clothe really means, yeah, come on up here. Give everybody a good look. All right, here. Just like my my one at home. Just like the one at home? All right. I'll tie it for you. But clothe here, here, turn to the side. Let me show you. Clothe literally means to tie a knot. It, it, and, and when he says this here, when Peter says, go ahead and clothe, I should permanently super glue this on him. When he says, doesn't he look nice? Isn't he like sharp? Okay. It's silly. It's funny. You got to take it off and step down. But I, I want to give you a visual illustration of what Peter is talking about in modern day terms. Now, now in their time, what it looked like was they would take a, a cloth or a towel, and they would tie it around their waist. First, they would take off their outer garments, and they would tie this cloth around, and it would drape down, and they would use it to, to wipe feet when they came in the house, and, and it would be a, a form of service. And, and so when he says in this verse, clothe yourself in humility, this is what he's speaking about. He's giving a very physical illustration, and they would register in their minds, oh, he's talking about a servant putting on the towel, putting on an apron clothing themselves with humility. As soon as he did that, what was he? He was humbled, right? I mean, that's silly. It's a funny illustration, but but that's the picture here he wants to convey, to clothe ourselves with humility. And the term was, in fact, used for slaves putting on aprons uh, over their clothes and, and serving that way. 
You see, humility is literally a lowliness of mind. It's an attitude that one is not too good to serve. You see, the first sign of spiritual immaturity is someone saying, too good for that. I I don't need to wash the children. I I don't need to scrub the toilets. I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that. I'm above that. And, And what he's saying here is all of you, first off, clothe yourself with humility. And he gives us a very physical illustration. It's an illustration that should make you think of John chapter 13. What happened in John chapter 13? Remember Jesus? God himself humbles himself, puts on the apron, and washes the disciples' feet. So there's our example. He says, clothe yourself. Like Christ clothed himself with humility in a physical, literal fashion, you and I are to clothe ourselves too. No one is excluded. The only one that's excluded here is unbelievers. Okay, because he's talking to believers. So, so, because this is something that is outside of the realm of, of, of humanity. It, it just isn't normal. Humility is not a normal thing. Christianity propped up and elevated humility. Made it something to be desired when all other people and nations and races and religions, you know, humility is not that big of a deal. But in Christianity, humility is a huge, huge deal. He says, clothe yourself with humility. You know, a couple things that Joe had to do when he came up here and did that is he had to choose to put it on, right? Humility is the same way. See, faith, we talked about faith a couple weeks ago. We talked about how faith just happens naturally, right? Because if we trust in God and we know our God and we, we know who he is, then we can walk by, by him and with him and we can trust him and faith begins to happen naturally, not because we have faith in just anything, but because of the, who the faith is in. It's in Jesus. But humility is different in that we have to put on the apron. We have to make the decision when somebody reacts to us a certain way, when our spouse reacts to us a certain way, when the church member reacts a certain way, we take the form of humility and we choose to act in humility. It's a choice. It's definitely a choice. It's a decision. And it's an idea that does run contrary to our culture, right? I mean, you just try to serve somebody out there and most people back away. Why are you doing that for me? I don't want you to do that, right? You ever tried to do something nice for a stranger? And they're like, why in the world would you do that? You ever try to serve somebody that, that, that you don't know? See, it's contrary to our culture. But we're commanded as believers to do it. Be clothed with humility. But then he specifically says to whom we are to be clothed to. Listen, the rest of verse 5, he says, Clothe yourselves with humility. Who to? Toward one another. We're to clothe ourselves with humility. We're to serve each other in the body of believers. So that person that you don't like, think about the person you hate most in this world. Let's just be real for a second, okay? Because everybody has bad feelings towards somebody. I hope right now you've asked for forgiveness and, and you've moved on and you're beginning to forgive them and you don't hate anybody, but the person you maybe dislike the most, God says, if you're a believer, you should serve that person. You should clothe yourself with humility towards that person person. That's a hard pill to swallow, right? That's a hard pill to swallow, but we're commanded to do that towards one another. It's given to all believers. See, if we could truly grasp this concept, not only would it heal and strengthen the church, it would heal and strengthen our marriages, our relationships with unbelievers, our relationships with children, our relationships with our parents, our relationships with church members. If we took this passage seriously and literally and obeyed the command here given by Peter, given by God through Peter, we have to humble ourselves to each other, even the people we don't like. Why? Because it paints a picture of who Jesus Christ is and it shows Jesus to be the humble servant that he is. Think about what that would do in your marriage. I I mean, practically. Your your wife, your husband says, Hey, I'm sorry. (laughs) And I mean it. And they do it first, without you prodding or poking. And then they go out of their way to try to serve you and try to love you in practical ways. Like they would put on an apron and they choose to do that. 
what's going what's gonna to happen is that person, that other person, no matter what their attitude is, as long as you're obeying God and you're saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust that God will, will do what he wants to do in me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and I'm going to serve and I'm going to humble myself, even though it might not be right and I don't agree with what they're doing and all those types of things, you put your place in, in, in a place of service and you say, listen, I'm here for you. You are more important than I am. I'm going to think about your needs, your wants, your desire, your good. Because ultimately that's what God did for us, right? And, and so in a marriage, do you see how that would wreck goodness and love and genuine concern and desire? And the person that used to be in love but has fallen out of love will begin to fall back in love because they see your heart of humility and service. And it's not, it's not sex-oriented, okay? It's not the male has to do it to the female and the female do it. No, he says, all of you, all of you, clothe yourself with humility. Think about your spouse more than yourself. Stop being selfish. Think about the other person. Put, put their needs above yours. Man, that's another hard pill to swallow, right? <laughs> I mean, because we're human. And our, our nature says, don't do that. Take care of yourself first. Self-preservation, right? But God commands us, all of us, put others before ourselves, humble ourselves towards one another. And then he gives the reason why. Verse 5, the last part, he says this, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here's the reason why. Because God can't stand the proud. That's what he's saying. He, he hates it. He hates them. He, he doesn't like them. He doesn't want to be near them. He doesn't, he doesn't think it's cute or funny when you're prideful. He, he hates it. He detests it. Don't go there. But in the very opposite context, he says, I'm drawn to those who, who are humble in heart and servant-hearted in heart. And, and they want to please me and please other people. And it's a reference to Proverbs 3.34, where it also says that God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. See, God resists the, pro the proud because God hates the sin of pride. You look in Proverbs chapter 6 sometimes and you see how much, you realize God hates some things. And one of the things he hates is pride. Why? Because it, it, it battles for his glory. You see, God is jealous for his glory. And that might sound a little conceited, a little weird, but what else would God be? <laughs> He's God, right? He deserves the glory. He deserves the recognition. He deserves our praise. He deserves all of those things. So when we become prideful, we're battling with God for that glory. And he says, I hate that. I'm God. I can't like that. I, don't, I can't have another lifted up next to me. That's why Satan, when he tried to do what he tried to do, that's why God threw him out and threw him. Threw him. I mean, that, that was a bad, the ultimate situation that was, that was just torn apart because God understood, or Satan basically was filled with pride and God had to separate that pride from him. And, and here's the thing with you and I. Think of any sin, any sin. Think about it in your head. Its root, its basis is pride. Ultimately, you're saying, I can look at what I want to look at. It's my life. That's pride. I can spend my money however I want to spend it. It's my life. That's pride. I can treat this person how I want to treat them. It's pride. It's pride. Pride is the heart of sin, and it angers God, and he hates it. He detests it. So he says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Some of us wonder why the power of God is absent from our lives, right? Have you ever wondered, how come, how come this person does so much for God and yet God is not really working in my life? We wonder why God's not showing up in our circumstances. Why everything's going the way it is. And I'd submit to you that most likely our pride is getting in the way. Because we're thinking of ourselves first. Remember we talked about humility. Humility is not thinking of ourselves poorly or lowly. It's not thinking of ourselves at all. And, and so, so when we think about what God wants for our lives, the first thing we need to understand is that pride gets in the way of God's glory, and then pride gets in the way of God wanting to do His will in our lives. So many people wonder where God is at certain parts, and what they don't realize is that by being self-focused, selfish, self-centered, and pride-filled, they regulate God to the sidelines. So you can't say, where is God in my life? How come he's not showing up? And yet you have pride in your heart. Why, why would God show up? Why would God come to bat for you? Why would God do anything? 
When your focus is on yourself and your life, God would just be aiding that and helping you live that life out if he came to your defense. No, God regulates himself to the sidelines when we put ourselves first. And he says, go ahead. Let's see what you got. Make a mess of it. That's what the children of Israel did time and time and time and time again, right? It was this vicious cycle. And pride hurts us in more than just our own personal ways. It hurts other people. It gets in the way of us humbling ourselves towards others. Now, I hope at this point that you realize that this is impossible to do this. To, to, to basically go ahead and humble ourselves towards one another. Do you understand that this is impossible? He's asking us to do an impossible thing. You're like, well, why is it in there? Why is it in there? Well, the, the scripture's not done, so let's look at the context. Look at verse number six. He says, therefore... Now, in Bible college, they said, whenever therefore comes up, you ask the question, what is it? Therefore, right? It's therefore because he's, he's just said what, you're, what you need to do, but here he gives us the answer in terms of how to do it and specifically what you need to do, what you and I need to do first. He says in verse 6, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. See, the reason a Christian has a hard time submitting and humbling themselves before others, the reason you have a hard time submitting and humbling yourself before your spouse is because you're not first humbled before God. The pride is in your heart and you say, my life is my life. I'm going to run it the way I want to run it. And so he addresses this and says, before you can can accomplish this thing of humbling yourself towards other people, you have to first humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. See, most of us take the, the Frank Sinatra tone, right? Remember Frank Sinatra? Just a messed up dude. He was. And he said, he had a song, I did it my way. And, and most of us, even Christians, I'm not speaking of unbelievers, we live lives like that. I'm going to do it my way. It's my life. God can't bless that. God can't work with you. You have no promises before God. If you take that attitude in your life, God has no, no, no responsibility towards you. And he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Who does he command to do this? He commands us. He says, you do it. You humble yourself. Most people wait for God to humble themselves. And then they're like, what's going on? Why are you doing this to me? Because you're walking out of my will. You're a child. I love you. I'm going to slap you around a little bit so that you'll get back in line. And he humbles us for us. Don't let, don't let it get to that point. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. It's our responsibility. Don't wait for God to do it. See, the only antidote to pride is the grace of God. And we receive that grace when we yield ourselves to him. And the evidence of this grace is what? The evidence is that we yield to one another. You want to know if somebody's yielded to God? See how they treat other people. If they yield and submit and are humble to their their spouses, to, to, to church authority, to other people who are on the same level and even beneath them, good chance is they're humbled before God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Under the mighty hand of God is an Old Testament phrase. And it has this connotation of God being sovereign. That his right hand is in control. And that if he controls our lives and he is sovereign and he knows exactly what we need, what's going on, that we simply come under his strong right arm and we submit to him. It's like a king is standing there with his hand open and we kneel before the king and say, King, whatever you desire, I'm under your authority. That's God's will for you. That's where it has to start, under the mighty hand of God, believing that God is in control, even when things don't seem like they are, even when things aren't going like we want them to go, humbling ourselves under his mighty hand. And then it says in verse 6 at the bottom, that he may exalt you at the proper time. That's in his time. You know, we can think of Bible characters, right? That, that <laughs> they had to wait a long time. For God to exalt them. You think about Moses, 40 years, right? You think about Joseph, 13 years. You think about Paul, who went in the desert for three years. You think about all these people 
who had to wait an extensive amount of time before God lifted them up. So, so what I want to tell you and what this is saying is just because today, if you say, okay, God, use me, I'm humble, I'm before you, I'll do whatever you want, I'm, I'm kneeling before you, here I am. If you say that today, don't expect tomorrow to everything to go perfectly good. That's not what he's saying. It, it, it'll take some time, and it might not even be in the, in the phrase or in the way that you think it should be done, but God will, he guarantees, he will lift you up. He will allow you to share in the spotlight, not for your glory, but for his glory. And he'll be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Maybe here, maybe in eternity. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you, or he will lift you up at the proper time. So we understand what we have to do, right? First things first, humble ourselves before God under his mighty hand. Second thing, humble ourselves towards one another. Now they're reversed, right? The first one comes first, or the first, humble yourselves towards one another comes first, and then humble your God, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. But what we need to learn is humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God first, and then we will naturally humble ourselves towards one another. But then there's a verse that comes out that just seems like it's out of place. Everybody look at verse number seven. He says these two things, and then he says, casting all your care or all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Casting all your care on him for he cares for you. What does this mean? Seems a little out of place if you don't think about it. He's saying this, it's conditional. That God will do what he says he will do for you here which is exalt you at the proper time, is conditional. It's conditional on verses 5 and 6, that we humble ourselves before God and that we humble ourselves before other people. Care here means anxiety. And it's truly the state of being, here it is, ready? Pulled apart. You ever feel like that? In your heart of hearts, that your life is just, Frustration, anxiety, fear, worry over everything. Some of you didn't need the definition. You knew all too well what, what anxiety really is, what, what that care is talking about, what worry really is. But then he gives good news. He says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, it's conditional. Remember this, okay? Now, one more illustration. This one's not as funny. Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. In the Bible, what this is referring to is one of two things. Some some people believe it's like casting a net, right? That's a good illustration. But really, I think here he's speaking of casting like they would throw a blanket or a saddle or something like that on an animal. So he says casting, let's pretend there's a donkey there. I could add Joe for that, but that would have been a little messed up, right? (laughs) Okay, so so, I mean, I want you to get the visual in your head. Casting all your cares on him for he cares for you. But here's what we do. Good. Hold on to it, don't we? We don't truly cast. See, casting here means Let it go. Let it go. Give it over to the Lord. Once and for all. And what he's saying here is is this is a one-time thing. You do it, you leave it alone. And then when you start to worry again, when you start to have an anxiety again, think back and remember, that's right. I'm submitted to God. I'm humble before Him. My life is in His hands. I want to do His will. I'm humble before other people. I want to put them first. Knowing those two things, God promises It's guaranteed. Write it down in ink. It's not going to change. We can cast our cares on Him. Why? He cares for us. If we do His will, if we walk according to His will, if we say, my life is yours, not mine, there's no sense of pride, and we humble ourselves before other people, we get to do this. We get to say, my depression, my anxiety, my worry, my despair, my bills, my everything, my family, done. Not mine anymore. What a freeing, freeing feeling. What a great feeling to be able to cast our cares. But then we, sometimes we don't let it go. We go back, we pick it back up. It's 
comfort some of us, right? Like Linus in his blanket. <laughs> and and, and we, we pick it back up and pick it back up and pick it back up. But God says, listen, just, just go ahead and cast it on me. I care for you. I desire your best. And if you will, it's conditional. Shake your head if you understand that we first have to submit and humble ourselves to God. And then submit ourselves and humble ourselves to others. Then the promise can be fulfilled. Don't expect anything from God if you haven't first humbled yourself to Him. Right? Everybody got that? That's the point of the message. Yeah, I just gave it to you, gift wrapped. And, and, and I hope that image sticks with you. I hope it, it, it embeds itself in your head and you remember the next time you begin to worry or have anxiety or despair or all those things, casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. The discontent the discouragement, the suffering, the pain, the worry, the despair, cast it on Him, for He cares for you. See, if you are submitted to God and you have humbled yourself before Him and are submitted to others, then and only then can you cast your care upon Him, for He cares for you. You know, I believe all of Scripture points to one thing. I believe all of Scripture points to one person, and it does the same here. See, God is humble. Think about that. It it seems like an oxymoron, right? It seems like a contradiction. God is humble. And he proved it. When he came in the form of Christ and, and he submitted himself, Christ submitted himself to God, humbled himself before God and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. You see, if you don't understand that your life exists for God's glory, you miss it. You don't get life. You don't get what it means to be a believer, to be a Christian. Your life exists for God's glory. In Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon talks about vanity of vanities, that everything is meaningless and, and it's just all bad and nothing I do. Richest, wisest man in the whole world and said everything's meaningless. And it's true for you and I. It's meaningless. It's vanities. Unless our lives point to something and someone that is eternal, and that's Jesus Christ. You want your life to count, to mean something. You want God to show up. You want to be able to cast your burdens on Him and leave it and not worry about it. First, submit yourself to God. Then submit yourself to others. And then we can cast our cares upon Him, for He cares for us few questions as we close. Are you submitted or humbled? Have you humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God? Have you done it? Answer it in your head right now. Have you picked it back up? Do you need to remember that you submitted your life to God? Maybe it was five months ago. Maybe it was five years ago. Maybe it was 50 years ago. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price and it costs Christ his life, his very blood. Secondly, are you submitting yourself, humbling yourself towards one another? It's easy to say, oh yeah, I'm submitted to God. It'll show up in your relationships. And lastly, if you have, if you've submitted yourself to God, you've humbled yourself to God, you've humbled and submitted yourself to others, guess what? You have a promise. Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to to hear from your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, for what it's done in my heart and in my life. And I pray, Father, that you would just continue to work in our hearts and lives. Lord, if there's anybody here today that needs you, Lord, that needs to come to saving faith and trust in you, if they've never truly trusted in your son and they're they're unsure of how to do it, Lord, help me to be clear in explaining it, that it's simple belief in Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did for them. Help them to... Stop trusting in their own good works or their own good deeds. Help them to trust in Jesus. To believe that he died for them and that he rose from the grave victorious over death. And Lord, that he wants to have a relationship with them. Pray, Lord, that you would work in hearts of our believers here today. That you would speak to them and help them to understand and help me to understand. That I constantly need to be submitted and humbled to you. Otherwise, I cannot guarantee a promise for myself from you. I ask, Lord, that you just work in our hearts. If there's someone here that needs to do business with you, I pray today that they would have the boldness and the courage to do that, that they would get it right with you, 
that they would pray to you and seek your face, that they would humble themselves before you, Father, so that they can ultimately cast their cares upon you. We pray that you are ultimately glorified and honored and and given praise the rest of today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We're going to sing here in a moment. Would you stand with me as we're about to worship? But I want to offer the opportunity. Maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart. You know, the Bible talks about that if you continually ignore God when he speaks to you and you know he's spoken to you, that he will allow your heart to harden. That over time it will become more callous. And it's like someone taking an iron and and rubbing it on on a wound and pretty soon you don't feel the pain anymore. And and so I want to encourage you this morning to to speak with the Lord, to do what you need to do and to, to confess your sins and submit yourself to God, to humble yourself before the Lord. We have people up here that will talk to you in private. My wife is over here to the right and Mike is here to the left. If you need to speak with them, please, they're here and they'll pray with you in confidence. They'll speak with you. Don't leave here without doing business with the Lord, without speaking to him about what he's doing in your heart and in your life. If you're here and you need to join the church, please come forward and see me. We would love to have you this morning and join our church and join our fellowship. Let's sing this morning and truly worship God the way he deserves.